All right, in this lecture, we're going to talk about the arm region. And in everyday life, when people say the arm, they're referring to really the whole upper extremity. But in anatomy, specifically, the arm region is actually the region between the shoulder joint and the elbow joint. And that's what we're going to cover in this lecture. All right, so we're going to transition to the skeletal model here to discuss the osteology. So here on the model, here's the, uh, the humerus and the arm. And you'll notice here's the head of the humerus. And it articulates with the uh, glenoid fossa of the scapula form that shoulder joint. And what you'll notice about the head of the humerus is it has two necks. So it has the anatomical neck, which is just distal to the articular surface here. And then you have the surgical neck, which wraps around this way. And what's important to know is that the, anat the anatomic neck here, this is where all this rotator cuff muscles will attach. The fibrous capsule will attach here as well. So all along here in the, in the actual body or in a cadaver or in surgery, the whole capsule, the rotator cuff, is, is attaching here on the humerus. Now on the surgical neck, that's important because the axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex humeral artery in the, uh, wrap around here, and then the, the anterior circumflex humeral artery will come around the front here and form that anastomosis. So that's why a fracture in this area could be injurious to both those structures. Now we're going to come back to uh, the more proximal area, and we're going to talk about um, some of the areas on the humerus where the, uh, some muscles attach. So you have this structure here, which is this kind of bony prominence here called the greater tubercle. And on the other side, you have the lesser tubercle, lesser because it's smaller. And then between the two of them, you have the interturbicular groove. Now the greater tubercle, the muscles that attach there are the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. And then on the lesser tubercle here, you have, this is the insertion site for the subscapularis. Now at the interturbicular groove, you have several muscles that attach there. You have the tendon of the long head of the biceps, which runs through the groove here. So it doesn't attach there, but it's running through there. Um, and it's covered by the transverse humeral ligament, which kind of travels, if you look at the probe, between the two tubercles. Um, and what's important to know about that is if that ligament were to become ruptured, um, the tendon could be released from the groove. Now the lateral lip, so this part right here of the intertubicular groove, that is the insertion site of the pectoralis major muscle. And then the medial lip here of the intertubicular groove, that is the insertion site of the teres major muscle. And then the floor down in here, the latissimus dorsi actually wraps in here and attaches there as well. So you have several muscles here, the, the pec major, um, teres major, and then latissimus dorsi, which all attach in this area. And then you have the long, uh, the tendon of the long head of the biceps running through here as well. And then another point to note is you have the deltoid tuberosity out here laterally. And that's where the deltoid muscle comes down and attaches so it can perform abduction of the arm. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the muscles of the arm. Now, the arm, like other areas of the upper extremity and uh, the lower extremity for that matter, are, are separated by fascial sheaths into compartments. Now, the arm is, the ant is divided into the anterior and posterior compartment. Now, this, sh this fascia, you know, you have fascia that's just deep to the skin that surrounds the musculature here. And then you have uh, sheaths of fascia that kind of extend out, and then they divide, and they attach to the bone here, the humerus in this case. Then you have another fascial sheath that extends here. And they divide the arm into the anterior and the posterior compartment. Remember, each compartment generally is innervated by, you know, all the muscles are generally innervated by one nerve, separate than the anterior compartment, and then the muscles of the posterior compartment tend to be more the extensor muscles, and then the uh, muscles of the anterior compartment are flexor muscles. So now, to talk about the anterior compartment, we're going to separate it out to this section here. They're all innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve, so that's easy. Anterior compartment, musculocutaneous nerve, remember it's the terminal branch of the lateral cord, the brachial plexus and they all act to generally flex the glenohumeral and elbow joints. And then one thing you'll notice here, if you go from, so this is your anterior surface, um, if you go superficial to deep down to the bone, you first you have your biceps brachii, that's the first muscle you would encounter. Then you have the brachial, brachialis muscle, which is then just deep to that, which lies right on the humerus. Those are the two muscles. And then coracal brachialis would be more medial, kind of in a more proximal section of this the anterior compartment of the arm. And one thing to notice here is that you have the median nerve and brachial artery traveling together really between the brachialis and the biceps brachii muscle, just medial and in, in between the two muscles here. So that's an important spatial relationship to be aware of. All right, so to go through the anterior compartment muscles, there's three muscles, and this table is in your book. Organizes it by origin, insertion, movement, innervation. 
So first, the coracobrachialis. The origin is the coracoid process, which is this bony prominence that projects anteriorly from the scapula. And you can see the, the coracobrachialis right here. Here's the muscle right here. And then it inserts onto the medial aspect of the humeral shaft. So behind all these muscles is the humeral shaft coming down like this, and you can see the muscle coming in like that. So for the movements, the main one is a shoulder flexion. The way to remember these movements is to, you know, obviously remember the origin insertion, and then remember the concept that muscles contract, okay? They contract, they shorten, and then they pull. This muscle is going to pull on this medial aspect of the humeral shaft towards the coracoid process. So it's going to pull towards that. And so it would make sense. This is going to shorten, this is going to shorten, it's going to pull, and it's going to flex the shoulder joint. Now, the other thing is, is there's a little bit of weak adduction of this humor. So pulling the arm towards the body. And so that makes sense. It's going to contract and contract, and it's also going to pull this way as well. And then the innervation is musculocutaneous, and that's easy to remember because the anterior compartment, all the muscles in the anterior compartment of the arm are musculocutaneous. The muscles in the posterior compartment are radial nerve. So again, breaking them down by compartments and remembering that each compartment has a general nerve innervating it can really help you cut down on the necessary memorization. So the brachialis muscle, this is shown right here, this is more the distal portion of it. The proximal portion where it originates is deep to the biceps brachii muscle right here. And if you remember your cross-sectional anatomy, so if this is the arm, this is the anterior, this is the medial, this is the lateral, this is the posterior, and then you have the humerus in here, and then you have your posterior compartment here, your anterior compartment here, if you remember, you first you have your biceps brachii, and then on, just deep to that, on top of the humerus bone, you have the brachialis muscle. So it originates from the medial and lateral surfaces of the humeral shaft, so from this aspect right here, and then it inserts onto the ulnar tuberosity, and you can see that right here. Here it is inserting right here onto this ulnar tuberosity, just on the proximal ulna here, crosses the elbow joint, and that makes sense. You know, you can see it here. Muscles contract, contract. They're going to pull. They're going to pull this way, elbow flexion. And again, it's anterior compartment, musculocutaneous nerve. And one thing to note is that, you know, most people think that the biceps is the major elbow uh, flexor, when in fact the brachialis is actually the major elbow flexor. So if you get asked on an anatomy exam, which of the following muscles is the major flexor of the elbow joint, the answer is going to be brachialis. It's not biceps brachii. The biceps, as we'll talk about on the next slide, is the major supinator. Even though it assists with flexion, elbow flexion, and that is not its major function. And lastly, to round it up, the biceps muscle here. So here you can see this very beautifully here. Here's the biceps muscle right here. It's got two origins. It's got the long head, which goes here. So this is the long. This is the short. The long head goes up here through that intertubicular groove at the proximal humerus and then goes into the shoulder joint. And if you remember... If we show our glenoid here, so this is our glenoid, we have our superglenoid tubercle, infraglenoid tubercle. This tendon is going to go through the shoulder joint and originate from this superglenoid tubercle, as we talk about right here on the scapula. The short head is going to originate from this coracoid process. You know, again, this anterior projection from the scapula where the coracobrachialis is originating. And then again, as we talked about in the pectoral region, the pectoralis minor also originates. So three muscles from this coracoid process, coracobrachialis, biceps brachii, and then the pec, pec minor. So the insertion is really mainly the radial tuberosity, which is a projection off of the proximal radius, and you can see that right here. And then also the fascia of the forearm via the bicepital aponeurosis, which is an aponeurosis, a thick connective tissue sheath that is just deep to the skin in this region as well. And so for the movements, the, again, the major function of the biceps is that it's the major forearm supinator. And the supination would be, again, if you remember, if you let your arm hang at its side, the palm of the hand is going to be facing posterior. If you supinate, which is the biceps, you're going to turn your, the palm of your hand to face anteriorly. If you were to extend your arm out and have the palm face down towards the ground, if you supinate, you bring the hand and face the palm towards the ceiling. Also, almost like it's ready to care, hold a cup of soup. So I like to think of it as, you know, supination, cup of soup. So you're sticking your hand out to hold a cup of soup. Now, Again, it crosses the elbow joint, so it, is, it helps with elbow flexion. It's also, you know, definitely a major contributor to elbow flexion, but it's not the major flexor of the elbow. And then also, since it crosses the shoulder joint up here uh, in its, you know, proximal origins, it's going to also help with shoulder flexion as well. And then innervation, it's in the anterior compartment, so it's going to be a musculocutaneous nerve. Now we have the posterior compartment. 
its main function is to extend the elbow and really it's it's the triceps is the only muscle involved here it's a large muscle it has three heads hence the name tri for three heads one thing i'll point out here is actually you have the radial nerve remember how we talked about how it travels just close to the humerus in that in that spiral groove and then it kind of wraps around like you can see it doing here to come and pierce this septum and actually travel down the lateral aspect of the arm so it's kind of in that transition point here and just to point this out on the on the model here so you have the long head which again goes to the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula you can't really see that here that's what's uh, traveling up here and again you have your glenoid fossa like this so this is your scapula superior inferior here's your glenoid you have your uh, superglenoid tubercle which is where the biceps tendon comes in and attaches the long head and then you have the infraglenoid tubercle which is where you have the long head of the triceps coming so key thing to remember here it's long head of both so long head of triceps long head of biceps coming in attaches on either side of the glenoid fossa the lateral head attaches to the humerus laterally here so you have the lateral head here you can actually see it marked here so laterally it attaches there and then the medial it's hard to see here we pointed it out on the skeletal model it attaches kind of inside of that or medial to the lateral head and not on inferior to the radial groove so if we look at a posterior view of the humerus and you have the radial groove coming in like this so that's your radial glue groove and you have your radial nerve traveling through there this is where the lateral head and is going to attach so this is lateral so if we go and draw the head of the humerus here in you know it articulating with the glenoid so the lateral head is going to attach lateral to the radial groove with the radial nerve traveling in and then the medial head is going to attach medial to the radial groove or spiral groove medial to the radial nerve now where is it going to attach the olecranon uh, of the ulna which is right here it's kind of a, an extension of the ulna which helps form the, el uh, the elbow joint and that's where the triceps attaches now remember triceps like any other muscle it's going to contract it's going to shorten so you shorten like this what does that do extends the elbow out okay pulls the elbow it's just gonna it's just like a lever arm it's gonna pull the elbow out that way so your elbow extension radial nerve innervation so now we're gonna talk about the blood vessels now the two important ones here are the circumflex humeral arteries it's a pair of arteries both come off the axillary artery more in the kind of the pectoral region and they wrap around they're called circumflex because they circle or wrap around the head the surgical neck of the humerus the smaller of the two is the anterior circumflex and it runs beneath that coracobrachialis muscle in the short head of the biceps so those two muscles that are attaching on that coracoid process of the scapula travels beneath those two and then around the and it comes around the anterior surface so you can see it here on the diagram labeled here it's this little branch coming around the front posterior circumflex that's the one that everyone talks about it's the larger of the two it arises from the axillary artery and then it travels through that quadrangular space that we talked about in the shoulder lecture so that's the quadrangular space and traveling with it you can't see in the diagram would be the axillary nerve through that space and with the axillary nerve the posterior circumflex artery it wraps around the posterior aspects of the posterior aspect of the surgical neck of the humerus forms an anastomosis with the anterior humeral circumflex now the brachial artery this is this is a main player here in the arm obviously so the brachial artery is just a continuation of the axillary artery so you have from medial to lateral you have the subclavian artery it's the, it form then it becomes the axillary artery and then at the board the inferior border of teres major becomes the brachial artery okay so I just want to make it clear that this is the same structure so in the cadaver lab you know there's no labels so the artery is the same it's the same structure all the way through even into the upper extremity all the way down to the elbow where it bifurcates it's the same it's just named for where territorially you are so you have subclavian, axillary, then it becomes brachial artery just at the inferior border of teres major. And then again, teres major right here forms the brachial artery there. The profunda brachial artery, that is an artery that branches off the posterior aspect of the brachial artery. So here, the large structure here is the brachial artery. It's coming off the axillary here. This is the profunda brachii here. And in this diagram, it shows it's splitting into two branches. One thing, just know that it's a major vessel off the off the po off the brachial artery profunda brachii and it travels in the posterior compartment 
on the posterior surface of the humerus with that radial nerve in the radial groove. So this dotted line here, this is here to indicate the radial, uh, radial groove or the spiral groove. I mean, again, it's named the radial groove because you have the radial nerve traveling with it. So those travel together. The brachial artery, now back to that, in the, this is the anterior view of the arm and it's coming in here after the bore, after Terry's major. And is one thing you should know here is that it travels with the median nerve all through. So this yellow line here, this is the median nerve traveling with it. And it travels down kind of the medial aspect of the arm between this, so this is your biceps brachii. And remember, just deep to this muscle is the brachialis muscle. So to kind of give you that spatial relationship, so just to kind of layer it on, we have the brachialis muscle. Then we have the, the brachial artery and the median nerve traveling together. Then on top of that, we have the biceps, okay? So it's almost like a artery and nerve sandwich between the two muscles. And then what happens down is, is the brachial artery passes through the cubital fossa, which is kind of a triangular depression here in the elbow. We'll talk more about that in the elbow lecture. And then it bifurcates into the radial and ulnar arteries. Now, one thing to note is the brachial artery pulse is palpable on the medial the anterior medial aspect of the elbow, so right in here, so you can palpate the brachial um, pulse in this region here. The brachial vein runs parallel with the brachial artery and drains the upper extremity. Now we'll talk about the nerves of the arm. Musculocutaneous nerve, just to review again, comes off the lateral cord, you can see it here. Here's your lateral cord. Okay, lateral cord comes through pierces that, this is a better look at that coracobrachialis muscle here. So it's kind of coming down here. I'm kind of outlining it here for you. That's coracobrachialis. As you can see here, it pierces through, and you'll actually see this in a cadaver if you dissect it. You'll see it piercing coming through the muscle like that, and then traveling here. Courses between the biceps and brachialis muscles. Innervates all the muscles of the anterior compartment. So coracobrachialis, brachialis, biceps brachii. After the elbow, it terminates into the, the lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve, which does kind of the lateral skin of the forearm, does the sensory innervation of the lateral, uh, lateral forearm. If you were to injure this nerve due to the muscles it innervates, you'd have weakness of supination because of that biceps muscle. It's a major supinator. And then obviously because of biceps and brachialis, you'd pr have very, very weak or absent flexion of the elbow. And then also because of that sensation provided by the anti lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve coming off muscu cutaneous, you'd have some uh, loss of sensation on the lateral side of the forearm here. And one thing I don't know if I mentioned, I should point out, is that the lateral antibrachial, that's the terminal branch of muscu cutaneous. So the radial nerve, it exits in that triangular interval, which is kind of marked here by this. So you have a triangle here formed by the, the triceps, and it gives off branches to the long and medial heads of the triceps brachii. So the, uh, here and here, and that's before it hits the radial groove. So once it's hit the radial groove of the humerus, it's already given off its motor branches. It's really one thing, it's, this is really important, especially for like when you have humeral fractures, which we'll talk about in a few slides, is that the branches off the radial nerve to the triceps are very, very early. It's like w right away once it hits the arm. So once it comes out of this interval, it's already, it's very early given off branches to the triceps before it hits the humerus. Okay, so after giving off the branches, like I was talking about, you can see it here. Here's the radial nerve, and this gives you a sense. Here's it's traveling. This is a posterior view. It's traveling in that radial groove here. So that's your radial groove. So that's your groove. It's grooving. Travels with that profunda brachial artery, which uh, also travels in the posterior compartment branches off the brachial artery on the posterior surface. Within the spiral groove, it wraps around the humerus and then pierces like I was talking about. So right here is where you're seeing it pierce the lateral intermuscular septum. So it pierces that lateral and then it enters the anterior compartment. So as you can see here on the, the radial nerve here is traveling. They have it marked here. It's going to be traveling down here kind of on the lateral, midway through the the arm is going to be traveling actually on the lateral aspect. And then it actually, you can see it here, it crosses over that lateral epicondyle. So that bony prominence we were talking about on the skeletal model. Actually, I'm sorry, this is, I apologize, this is actually incorrect. It gives off several uh, branches to the triceps in the arm. The ulnar nerve is the terminal branch of the medial cord. So as again here, here's the uh, ulnar nerve coming off the, the medial cord here. And it travels down the medial aspect of the arm. The ulnar nerve does not give off any branches in the uh, arm. It doesn't do any innervation. 
One thing to point out, though, is midway down the arm, it pierces that intermuscular symptom on the medial side, and then it, it descends down and passes over the posterior aspect of that medial epicondyle. So you have the medial epicondyle here, and it travels posterior. So if you look at it from, if we're looking at a medial, and you have the humerus coming down here, and you have the medial epicondyle here, the ulnar nerve is traveling posterior to it. Now, the median nerve, median nerve enters again at that inferior margin in this diagram. So there's your median nerve. It courses down, traveling with the brachial artery between the biceps brachii and the brachialis, so between those two muscles. Now, one thing that's important to note is if you'll notice, so this is your lateral side, and this is your medial side, is the nerve initially, it travels lateral to the, to the brachial artery, and then it travels down, and then about midway through, it crosses over, and then in the distal part of the, the arm or near the humerus, it travels actually medial to the brachial artery before it enters the cubital fossa, which is in this area here. And again, gives off no branches in the arm. So the radial nerve, that gives off branches to the triceps, but then median and ulnar nerves, those give off no branches in the arm. Just real quickly talk about the dermatomes. We really only care about the arm section here. The medial brachial cutaneous nerve does the medial side of the arm, and then the axillary is, is important to point out that it does the lateral aspect here of the, of the arm. Okay, now, and just to finish it up, we're going to talk about some clinical pearls. The proximal humeral shaft fracture. So we were talking about this earlier with the skeletal model. Mechanism of injury, this is typically people that fall on an outstretched upper extremity, like in a high or in a high energy trauma. So here's your surgical neck here. And again, here's your quadrangular space here. And then you have your put your artery traveling here, and then your axillary nerve traveling here through the quadrangular space and wrapping around that surgical neck. The important thing clinically what you'll notice this is really is injury to the axillary nerve. Sure, you'll injure the artery, but clinically what you'll notice is that they'll have weak abduction because the deltoid will be de-innervated, and then they'll have decreased cutaneous sensation over the lateral aspect of the arm on the skin there. So that's how you would test that clinically, is you would test the strength of their abduction, and then you would test their cutaneous sensation over the lateral aspect of the proximal arm. So mid-shaft humeral fracture. Mechanism injury, again, it's kind of a direct trauma to the arm, fall, or maybe you fall on an outstretched arm. Big thing here is the mid-shaft, so you, you know, right here in the mid, not proximal, not distal as you have an injury to the radial nerve. And again, here is that groove here. Here's that groove. This is the lateral attachment here of the triceps. And then this is the medial tra attachment of the, medi or the medial head of the triceps. And then in between you have the radial groove with the radial nerve. Remember the artery, profunda brachia artery is traveling there too. And the important thing to note here is elbow extension, despite what you may initially think, is it's actually intact. And I remember I made a big deal in that other slide about how when the radial nerve comes out of that triangular interval, it gives off those branches right away. So it, by the time it has hit this radial groove, it's already given off the branches to both the, the uh, medial and lateral and long heads of the triceps. It has already given that off, and then it hits the, ra the radial groove. So it's already given those branches off. So injuring the radial nerve here doesn't matter because you've already given off your innervation. So what do they present with? Now the problem is, is the radial nerve, as you can see here, it goes all the way down the forearm, all the way down to the wrist. And so what they're going to present with is normal elbow extension, but they're going to have weak wrist and finger extension because the radial nerve is, innervates the muscles that do that as well. It's weak wrist and finger extension. And when you have weak wrist extension, that's what's called wrist drop because the wrist kind of just hangs there. Significant fractures in this region can also damage not only the profunda brachia, but the brachial artery itself. Just because the brachial artery is traveling in this region as well, if, if it's a really displaced fracture, and that can be a, a surgical emergency because if it lacerates the artery, you could develop uh, severe hemorrhage and ischemia to the upper limb. And that concludes our lecture on the arm.